Today we are honored to have with us, uh, I think one of the greatest missionaries in the world, Scott Hansen, has been my friend for more than 20 years. He's been very instrumental in helping form and shape our approach to missions, which is called missiology, our approach to missions here. When Scott first started helping us, the year before we gave about $300,000 to missions, Last year, you gave over $3 million to missions, which is pretty remarkable. He's been a big part of that and a big part of our lives here. He's been here many times. So if you're new, you're going to love him. If you've been around for a while, you already do love him. I asked him to come and share with you some of the results of your giving over the years. You're going to love it today. Would you welcome back? Scott Hansen. One more time. Well, thank you. It is so good to be back in North Little Rock. We always feel like we're coming home when we come here. We've been coming here for many, many years. This is our home church in the States. We love you guys. It's great to see so many familiar faces and get to meet some new people. Psalms chapter 126, verse 5, the Bible says, those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Pastor Daniel helped me understand this verse. He planted a church in a little village called Sangi on the coast in Tanzania. I remember the first day I got to meet Pastor Daniel. We drove into the village. He was standing in the doorway of the church, as we got out and began to greet him, it was obvious that there was fire burns along the door jams, and then we walked into the church, and you could smell smoke, and you could see the charred um, rafters where the church had been burned. We were wondering what was going on, and as he began to share his story, he explained that in their context, there was a lot of extremists in the village that didn't want him there. And twice in the last two years, they had set the church on fire trying to burn him out. I remember wondering to myself, and I eventually even asked him, I said, man, aren't you afraid to be in a place where there's burning churches? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, I am not afraid of any place where God is. Amen. I love that. I am not afraid of any place where God is. He began to share the story of what was going on in the church, and I remember he told me one testimony in particular that grabbed my heart. He said there was a young boy whose dad was a leader in the mosque. He got very sick, and so his parents began to take him to different clinics in the area to try to get him help, and then they eventually went to a hospital. Nothing seemed to work, so they took him and, um, to witch doctors nearby. That didn't work either, and the boy continued to get weaker and weaker, and the parents became more and more desperate. Eventually, he heard about a powerful witch doctor who lived in the middle of the forest, not too far from where he was at. So they made arrangements, made payments, and on the given day, he carried his weak son into the forest to see this witch doctor. As they stepped into the clearing where the witch doctor lived, he saw a crowd of people, and they were crying and wailing. He asked them, he said, what's going on? They said, haven't you heard? The witch doctor dropped dead this morning. The man was brokenhearted. I mean, this was his last sliver of hope for his child. Turning around, sad, and he began to walk back into town, not knowing what to do. And the Lord dropped in his heart Daniel's name. What about Daniel? Maybe I can get help there. So he goes straight into town, finds Daniel's house, knocks on the door, explains the situation. Daniel laid hands on the boy, prayed for him, and God instantaneously healed him. He gave his, amen. He gave his heart to Christ, and he became a member of our church. And today, that church is still standing strong. Daniel sowed with tears into the village of Sangi so that the church could be planted. There is a cost at sowing seed. You know, this is one of the most generous churches in the world. 
month after month when I hear the reports of what you've done. It's amazing to me because I know that your giving is sacrificial, that you sow with tears. I hear testimonies, stories of children who have given up birthday parties so that they can help people in need in your missions offerings. Couples who opted to go with simple weddings instead of something more elaborate so that they could participate in what God is doing around the world. Single moms who have sacrificed to give. Your giving is sowing. Sowing with tears. When I told Daniel's testimony here about 15 years ago at First NLR, there was a young girl here named Morgan Jumper. Her heart was touched, and she wanted to help raise money to build him a church. This meant she was going to have to give up special things, invest her birthday money, sacrifice so that he would have a church building. And I know it wasn't easy. It cost her. And yet she sowed with tears to plant the church in Sangi. No, the tears of sowing are not just wept by planters in Africa. They are also wept by people like you who invest in seeing the church planted around the world. Thank you. Thank you for your part in what you're doing to see the gospel go to every corner of the world. There is a cost to sowing the seed, but there's also a promise. We sow with tears, but we reap with songs of joy. You have sown sacrificially, but I want you to know that there is reason for joy. Both Daniel and Morgan's tears watered the seed, and today, in a place where Jesus was unknown, people are in relationship with him. In a place where there was silence, today Jesus is worshiped. Thank you. Thank you for sowing with tears into the village of Sangi. Over the years, you've partnered with hundreds of planters across the world, especially in Africa, sowing so that Jesus would be known. Thank you. Thank you for years of relationship and partnership. Pastor Rod, Pastor Parker, We love you guys. We appreciate you. You know, Pastor Rod and I have been friends for over 20 years. We were good looking back then. (laughs) You know, from the beginning, our hearts were united because we shared a common passion for church planting. About that time in the early 2000s, we were starting a project in Tanzania called the Tarafa Project. Our goal was to plant 230 churches in strategic areas across the country. This was right about the same time the church was celebrating their one, your 100-year anniversary. And to do so, Pastor Rod wanted to celebrate by planting 100 churches around the world. It was called the 100 by 100 Project. We begin to partner together, investing in, ch- in church planting amongst the unreached in Tanzania in other places in the world. Along the way, we met some amazing people with some unbelievable stories of both sacrifice and God's provision as they sowed the gospel seed. This morning, I'd like to share some of those stories with you. Pastor Madangi was one of our friends we met during that time. He had a great church up in northern Tanzania in the mountains of Mbulu. When they first started the church, it was tough going. The church was in a hard area. There was a lot of witchcraft. The people were resistant and really didn't want to have anything to do with Pastor Madangi. But slowly, he began to build bridges in the community. He began to show love to people, and the church began to grow. They began to experience a revival, and soon they had 250 adults and over 100 children coming to church. People were getting saved. The church was growing. They decided that they needed to build a building, and so on their own, they began to raise money. They sacrificially gave to build the church. In fact, the young people in the church would carry the iron sheeting on their roof on their heads for 30 miles up into the mountains so that they could put a roof on their church. During this time, Karen and I were doing exploratory trips across Tanzania, finding unreached people groups, places where we didn't have churches, and so we invited them to go on one of the trips with us. We went up right on the Kenya border 
to a people group called the Maasai. I remember we drove through village after village, and every village that we stopped in, we would get out of the car and we would ask, do you, do you know anything about a man named Jesus? Are there any churches in your village? And time after time, our hearts were hurt because we heard that there was virtually no gospel communication happening. On the way home, after two or three days of visiting villages, Pastor Madangi was very quiet. God was dealing with his heart. And I was wondering what, what was going on. Well, a couple of weeks later, he came by the house and asked if we could sit down, and he began to share what was on his heart. He said, you know, God has been really speaking to me about the people in Loliondo. And he said, I feel like God is calling me to move back there. Now, not only was this an unreached area, but it was also an extremely difficult area to live in. There were bandits all over the place. People were getting robbed and often beaten up. Transportation was very difficult to get. There was no public transportation. It was a remote area without a lot of food, and people were really resistant to the gospel. As I thought about what he was leaving and where he was going, I asked him, I said, what about your church? You're just about finishing your building project. You're experiencing an amazing revival. What's going to happen to your church? I'll never forget, he looked at me and he said, I think, Scott, it will be easy to find someone to pastor my church. But who is going to go to Loliondo, to the hard place, to share the gospel with the Maasai if I don't go? I've been there, I've seen, and God is calling me. A short time later, he and his wife moved to Loliondo and began to plant the church. They sowed with tears. They left an amazing church and went to a hard area. They sacrificed and suffered to plant a church in a little town called Wasso. But as they planted the seed, a harvest began to grow. And today, there is a vibrant church in the village of Wasso. You see, the kingdom grows as the seed is planted, as the cost is paid. It requires sacrifice, both for those who plant, like Madangi, and those who water, like you, who come alongside people like Madangi, praying so that the soil will be fertile, partnering to strengthen the hands of the pastors, sowing with tears, knowing that one day there will be songs of joy because of the harvest. Yeah, there is a cost, but there's also a promise. Thank you. Thank you for sowing with tears into the Maasai in northern Tanzania so the gospel could be known. Another area that you've invested in over the years is the Swahili coast. Not only have you invested a lot of money and offerings there, but you also have sent people from the church, your own family members, to help establish the church there. One of the guys we met with early on, his name is Teddy Komba, and he's one of my good friends and favorite people. He has some of the most amazing stories I've ever heard. He planted a church in a town called Mahonda. He paid a high price to plant the church there. I mean, they were persecuted in all sorts of ways, ranging from verbal abuse to social isolation. They were kicked out of their homes when they tried to rent them. And yet, when you talk to them about their community, only love radiated out of their hearts. Not that it was necessarily easy. Mrs. Comba told us about how once she almost gave up and went back to the mainland. She explained how there was a group of young men in the village who weren't very happy about what was going on in the church. And they decided that they were going to discourage the Combas to the point where they would leave and go home. So what they did was one Saturday night, these young people snuck over to the church. They climbed into through the window into the church sanctuary and they went to the bathroom all around the sanctuary. Sunday morning, Mrs. Comba goes in to sweep up and of course immediately there's a stench. She can see everything is filthy. She cleans up the church and they had their service. Well, the next week it happened again and then short time later again and this went on for several months. And she got to the place where she was so discouraged, she just prayed a simple prayer and said, Lord, I don't know if I can take it much longer. The Lord gave her this sense of peace, and then he did something extraordinary. He sent an owl to roost near the church. 
Now, in Africa, an owl is known as a bird of ill omen, a superstition, bad luck. And so the people in the village immediately noticed that there was an owl outside of the church, and they begin to talk. What's going on here? Why is there an owl here? What's happening? The young men were like, you know, we don't care about owls. Just wait. We will show her on Saturday night. We're going to go back to the church. So sure enough, Saturday night rolls around. They go sneaking over to the church, put their hand on the windowsill, get ready to jump in, and all of a sudden that owl comes swooping down out of the tree, chasing those young guys all the way back to their homes in the village. <laughs> and they never came back again. All they could talk about was this amazing power protecting this church. But just imagine the combas, day after day, going into the church to clean up someone else's waste. You're mistreated, ostracized, not cared for, and yet they refused to leave. They stayed on their own free will. Why? Why did they choose the path of pain and suffering? It's because the combas knew that to plant the church in Mahonda, there would be a price to pay. And they sowed with tears until the church was established. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for being a part of the Combas story. But that's not the only thing going on on the Swahili coast. With your investment there, it wasn't surprising that God began to speak to people's hearts. And soon, Michael and Tiffany Richardson some of your church members felt like God was calling them to go help establish the church. Now, the Swahili coast is not an easy place to live. It's a place of darkness, oppression, radical Islam, witchcraft. When you walk through the maze of streets in the main city, you'll pass through areas where Al-Qaeda is actively recruiting people. It's a tough place. When Michael and Tiffany moved there, they sowed their lives into that island and it wasn't easy. While they didn't suffer physical persecution, they paid an incredible price in many other ways, living in a spiritually dark environment. Climate is hot and humid. They left their family in the States. They had to learn another language and culture. They sowed in tears for the church to be planted. But God honored those seeds. And through a series of events, Michael connected with a young man named Nick. And through their friendship, a seed was planted that has led to one of the most amazing stories that I've ever heard of in my 30 years of being a missionary. See, Nick was a teacher and a Muslim, and he was on a quest to find the truth. He wasn't sure where he would find it, but he knew that once he found out what the truth was, there was no way he was not following it. In his quest, he ran into Michael, who encouraged him to start reading his Bible. He also mentioned that he was returning back to the States, but there was a guy named Roger, and he said, if you'll connect with Roger, Roger will help explain the scriptures to you. As Nick and Roger began to walk through the Bible, Nick realized that this indeed was the place where truth would be found. And one day when he and Roger got together, Nick explained to him that he had made the decision to serve Jesus no matter what the cost. Almost immediately, he began to pay a high price. He was kicked out of his house. He lost his job. He was threatened. But that didn't stop him. He continued to tell all of his friends about Jesus and the truth in the scripture. He loves Jesus so much. He exudes a passion for Jesus. The pressure began to grow, and eventually his wife was kidnapped and taken away from him. A short time later, he received word that she had lost the baby that she was carrying. He was heartbroken. But he found different ways that he could secretly communicate with his wife until one day all the communication stopped and he didn't hear from her. Eventually, he heard word that she had died, very likely killed by the people who had kidnapped her. Nick and Roger sat together and they wept at his loss. Nick continued to share his faith, and soon a small group of brothers was formed. 
people who had given their hearts to Christ. Every single one of them has experienced persecution. They've been kidnapped. They've been ostracized by their families, kicked out of their community, locked in rooms, beaten, left without food and water for days. But they absolutely refused to turn their backs on Jesus. In fact, several of them went on a seven-day fast. The purpose of the fast was for them to pray, God, what is your direction for us? They knew in the Bible that there were times when the Apostle Paul would leave in the face of persecution, but they also knew there were times when he would stay. And they said, Lord, we want to know what your plan is for us. And as they listened to the Spirit, they felt like he was calling them to go back, to stay on the island, and to continue to plant the church. They told the team, this one shocked me, they told the team, they said, They never wanted to be rescued by force. If they were going to be kidnapped, they said, even if you find out where we're going to be, please don't come and rescue us by force. They wanted God to be the hero in their story. And they told our team, they said, God can protect us. He can protect us and free us if he wants to. Not long ago, people broke into Nick's house. They grabbed him. They cut him with a knife and took some of his blood an indication that they were going to put a curse on him. And then a short time later, they kidnapped him. They locked him up in a house and for hours tried to convince him to come back to Islam. They tried to convince him to give up on Jesus. He listened to them for several hours. And after all of their talking, he quietly responded that his faith was in Jesus and he was never turning away from him. They gave him overnight to think about it one last time, and when he refused that morning, they took him outside to a clearing, and he looked around, and there was piles of stones set aside where the people were going to stone him to death. He went to his knees and began to pray, waiting to be killed. As he began to pray and worship in the spirit, an incredible peace came over him, And for about 10 minutes, he was lost in the spirit. And all of a sudden, he became cognizant that there was no voice, no noise around him. And he looked around, and everybody was gone. They had all run away. God had miraculously saved him. I cannot tell you what it's like. We've been praying for this island for years You've been praying and investing in this unreached people group where the soil has been so hard. And yet today, there are six believers amongst that people group. And they have a, a courage and a passion and a plan to see their people reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a cost, but there's also a promise. When we sow with tears, we reap with songs of joy. I wish you could just spend a few minutes with some of these guys. They don't feel like beat up, discouraged people. They feel like courageous believers of Jesus Christ. And they exude the fruit of the Spirit joy in every part of their life. Thank you. Thank you for sowing with tears into the Swahili coast. Another area you sowed into was the village of Kwamtoro. Pastor Charles Ndao was the guy who was pastoring a church there. It's an extremely difficult area in north central Tanzania where one of the most radical Muslim groups we have live. Pastor Ndao started his church in 2004, and he began to build relationships in the community, began to build a bridge. People began to come to to faith, and he didn't realize it, but there was a storm brewing. Because as the church grew, about 20 members of a radical sect decided that they were going to get rid of the church. So they snuck over to the church on a Thursday evening, and they loosened all of the nuts that were holding that prefab building together. It was still standing, but it was completely loose. Well, Pastor and Dow didn't know anything that was going on, and the next day, he and the church went for their Friday night prayers. 
It's not uncommon in Tanzania to have all-night prayer meetings. So they went when it was dark, and they were having their prayers. And as they were praying, the wind picked up, and the building began to go back and forth. But there was no electricity. So they didn't notice what was happening around them. And all of a sudden, the building came crashing down. Everybody scrambled from underneath, and they did a quick head count, and they realized that one person was missing, Pastor Ndao. So they crept back underneath the church, and they found him pinned between the truss and the column. They tested him for a pulse, and they couldn't find any heartbeat. He was dead. They leveraged up the building so they could pull him out. They laid him on the ground. This is an area where there's no hospitals, no clinics, no ambulances, no help except for God. And that's what they did. They turned to Jesus and they said, Jesus, we know that you've done it in the past. We believe you can do it now. We pray, Lord God, that you would heal our pastor. And as they prayed, the impossible happened. And he began to breathe again. God brought him back to life. He was still hurting, so they took him to the hospital. He was in the hospital about a month. And as if that wasn't enough, during the time when they were in the, he was in the hospital, the attackers came back to where Mrs. Ndao was living, and they beat her severely. I remember hearing that um, everything that had happened, the church being knocked down, the pastor being hurt, and the, Mrs. Ndao being hurt, and so as I was traveling through, I popped in, and I, I asked them, I said, why, why are you guys still here? And I remember he told me, he said, you know, it doesn't matter where you go, there'll be a cost to do the work of the kingdom. And he said, I'm not leaving this place until the promise that God God has given me comes to fruition. I remember when I got home, I, I called up Pastor Rod, and I asked him, I said, is there any chance um, that you guys could help out with this church that's been destroyed? And immediately you guys responded. And through your investment, in the matter of a couple months, we were able to rebuild the church, this time with stone walls so it couldn't be destroyed. You guys help us build a parsonage so that the family would be safe from attacks. The people in Quamtoro were dumbfounded. They were shocked. They said an unfinished church gets destroyed, and in a blink of an eye, another completed church grows out of it. Our leaders laughed and they said, they won't touch this church because they're worried if they do, an entire Christian village will show up overnight. (laughs) Cost Pastor Ndao and his family immensely to plant the church in Cuantoro. He sowed with tears and you came alongside of him, watering, cultivating, investing sacrificially so that the Rangi tribe might come to know Jesus. And today... There is a vibrant church in Cuamtoro, still pastored by Pastor Ndao. Thank you. Thank you for sowing with tears for the church to be planted in Cuamtoro. One of the most unreached areas in Tanzania was Lindi and Amtwara on the southeastern coast of Tanzania. It's an area entrenched with Islam, crazy unreached. Transportation is horrible. The infrastructure is underdeveloped during the rainy season. The roads could could be shut down for months at a time. When we started traveling in that area, there were literally only a handful of churches for a massive area. I remember Pastor Rod, we drove into that area with two cars, driving down these dusty roads. We would go through village after village, and each time we'd go through village, we would ask our local friends, is there any church here? And they would respond, no. It was heartbreaking, and we would, we would stop, and we would pray, and we'd say, God, somehow help your gospel to be presented in these villages. God began to call people, and we began to plant with them church planters who sacrificed to see the church planted on the coast. Pastor Buihu was one of those guys. He paid a high price to plant the church in his town. Since they started their fellowship, they've been stoned, They've had feces thrown at them. They've had their building bombed. One of the church members was martyred for his faith. He was demon-possessed, deeply in darkness, when he went to ask for prayer for help. After being prayed for, God completely healed him. He was set free from the power of the demons, and he gave his heart to Jesus. 
Almost immediately a crowd gathered around him and began to beat him, coercing him, trying to get him to return back to his faith. But he proclaimed, he said, I was sick, but now I am whole and I will not renounce Christ. They continued to beat him and a couple of days later he went on to be with his Savior, still serving and loving Jesus. Pastor Buiho himself has been beaten, dragged into the bush and left for dead. And his only reply when I asked him about it was, God has spoken to me and given me this place and I will not leave. You see, he understands the principle that there is a price to pay, but there's also a promise. He is sown with tears, but today he's reaping with joy because there is a church that's in his town where people are coming to know Jesus. Together, as we travel through that area, God opened the door, and we were able to start almost 40 churches in 40 counties where there were no churches at that time. You guys were a major part of that. Thanks. Thank you for sowing with tears so that churches could be planted and lives could be touched. You know, one of the beautiful things about planting seed is that there's a multiplication factor over the years. You see, as seed is sown, churches are planted. And then those churches, in, plan, in turn, plant other churches. And those churches, in turn, plant other churches, which plant other churches. And the ripple effect ends up touching not just one community, but dozens of communities and thousands of people. One of the things I love about our long-term partnership is that occasionally we get to see the exponential impact of the seed that we've sown. Recently, I was back in Tanzania, and I asked for some follow-up. What's going on in some of these areas? And the stories I heard are quite impressive, very exciting. Madangi, he went to plant a church in the village of Waso and ended up planting 25 churches and started a Bible school. On the Swahili coast, a completely unreached people group that we've worked for years and years to see the church established, today sees a church of six former Muslims who have a passion and vision to reach their islands. A miracle. Pastor Ndao went from an area where there was just a few churches to today being over 65 churches in his area, and he is the district superintendent of all of those churches. In Lindy and Mtwara, we went from a handful of churches to planting 40 churches, and today those 40 have multiplied, and there are 234 churches. That's what it means when we say, we sow with tears, but we reap with songs of joy. Not long ago, I was talking to our general superintendent in Kenya, and he began sharing about one of the challenges the church is facing there. He said they have over 350 churches that have been planted where we don't have a place to worship. He said most of them worship under trees. And I asked him, I said, like literally underneath trees? He said, yes. He said, when it rains, they can't have church because everyone gets wet. In the hot season, there's very re little relief from the sun beating down on them because they don't have a roof over their head. In one of our churches, they had to abandon their tree because elephants came in and pushed it over. Karen and I went to visit one of those churches in a small coastal village called Katzinuni. Our pastor there is named Job. He works down the road in a shoe factory but has a huge heart for this village. The local people there are nominal Muslims and animists, and the local witch doctor was not too surprising, was not very happy about a church being started. She tried to stir up the community against them. She tried putting curses on Pastor Job. But undeterred, he continued to faithfully minister in the village, preaching the gospel and sharing the love of Jesus. Not just in word, but in deed. When he heard about a family with nine kids who had lost their home, he rallied their handful of believers, and they built a little mud hut for those people to live in. The people in the village are extremely poor. In fact, the church is mainly made up of ladies, and, and the only way they make money is by harvesting grass 
And with that dried grass, they make brooms, like this one. This one actually came from that village. They dry out the grass, they put it together as a broom, they sell them for about 20 cents a piece. As you can imagine, people who sell brooms for 20 cents a piece don't have a lot of extra funds. I don't even know how they would build a church. So right now they're meeting under a mango tree. The cost to build a church is about $4,000. If you need land in a village area, you can usually get one some for $300. Imagine how long it would take to raise that kind of money from people who make their living selling 20 cent brooms. Today, we have an incredible opportunity in front of us. A chance to come alongside those who are sowing with tears and to help these churches get a foundation they need to grow. You see, when a church has a building, not only does it protect the people from the elements, but it also announces to the community that the church is there to stay. It gives the church a base from which they can start new churches. When we invest in planters and church plants, the ripples not only impact the church, but they impact hundreds, thousands of people as those churches plant churches that plant churches that plant churches. I can't wait 15 years from now to see the impact of this project as we begin to sow into Kenya so that these churches can be established and continue growing and proclaiming the gospel. Thanks so much for all you do for the kingdom. We love and appreciate you.